Beth, would you like to open it up or? I will. I'm going to wait all the attendees. I see the attendee numbers coming up. Welcome, everybody. I'll go ahead and start once that levels off. All right. Welcome, everybody. I see everyone's, all the attendees are joining the webinar. All right, it seems like everybody who is in the waiting room has joined. Welcome, my name is Beth Levin. I'm the Director of Professional Degree Programs for the College of Engineering at UC Berkeley. Um, it's great to have everybody here. Thank you for your interest in the Master Advanced Study in Engineering from UC Berkeley. All right, let's begin. All right, this is our agenda for the hour. Um, my colleagues and I will go over um, the program aspects, including the curriculum, um, and we'll spend um, a majority of this hour on um, admissions uh, tips and advice um, for how to create a competitive and successful application for the Mass E program. Um, and during our time together, please ask questions um, using the Q&A function um, in your um, Zoom panel. Um, and we will answer questions both during the presentation as well as um, at the end. We'll, we'll take some questions there um, that we'll share for the group. So please feel free to ask questions at any time. All right, now I would like to introduce my colleagues that are here with me today. Um, we have our faculty director and our academic program coordinator. Uh, Tarek, would you like to please introduce yourself? Um, hello, I'm Tarek Zodi. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and also associate dean for research at UC Berkeley, and I'm also the faculty director of the Massey program. Welcome. Great to have you here today. And Felicia. Hi, everybody. My name is Felicia Rabang. I'm the academic program coordinator for the Massey program. It's nice to meet everybody. Great to have you here, Felicia. And Felicia will be attending um, to the Q&A in um, the Zoom panel. So if you have any questions, um, you can send those her way. All right, so now I'd like to pass the presentation um, over to Tarek, who's going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, the first half of the presentation um, to talk about the program, curriculum, and career. Tarek, take it away. All right, well, the Mass E program was designed in a way that uh, it was going to be uh, less balkanized than normal master's degrees in, in the College of Engineering in the sense that it's not uh, dependent upon a single department. It encompasses the best from all the different departments in the College of Engineering. And uh, nearly every single department in this in the College of Engineering is in the top 10. In fact, all are in the top 10. And we've drawn from the best of what we could draw from, from electrical, mechanical, nuclear, bioengineering, material science, computer science, environmental engineering, and so forth. So what you're seeing there is a very flexible program that you're able to draw from classes in several different tracks. So I think we can go to the next slide. So the idea is, is that uh, we're, we're doing this for working professionals. We've tried to make it flexible in a way that uh, each of the courses is a one-unit class, so you take 22 one-unit classes and a two-unit capstone, and the granularity is fine enough that you can take a wide range of things in your interests. Uh, it's self-paced, as I said, a total of 24 units. Uh, it is asynchronous, but there are live uh, office hours every week, and there's also uh, live uh, office hours with TAs and, and so forth. And these are real faculty that are the actual faculty at UC Berkeley. They're not uh, temporary instructors or things like that. They're really the same faculty that teach these classes uh, in person also on campus. Our idea is that uh, in many cases, it's difficult for a working professional or someone maybe starting out their career to take time off to do a master's. 
So the idea was to in, embed as much flexibility as possible. However, we realize it could be people that have just graduated and simply want to do a master's online. That doesn't preclude that that fact. So, you know, what your interests are, are, are the key things, because the ability to tailor your uh, set of, of, of courses that you take is critical to the program. So I think uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, Pal. So as I indicated, it's 24 units. Uh, the time to complete, roughly between one, you know, if you're doing it full time, I, we believe that one year is very comfortable for a person that's devoting all their time to the Mass E. Uh, four years, of course, if you're, you know, uh, in a, I guess, a busy working schedule, we have an upper bound as well. But we think that the median is is in the range of about two years. If you're working part time, you can comfortably fi uh, finish this master's degree program. Uh, it is a certified uh, program that was uh, approved by the UC system uh, that went through several years of rigorous scrutiny. Uh, we were reticent for many years. Berkeley has not had many online programs, so this is one of the first ones we've ever had, uh, especially in engineering. Uh, and it's experiential in the sense that we really try to make it very hands-on uh, to the maximum extent possible that you can do this in an online setting. Uh, and the capstone also uh, brings in several of those uh, ideas. The capstone is designed in such a way to draw from the 22 classes that you take and to provide you with an experience that uh, blends and integrates all of the things you've learned. Uh, in general, the, the faculty that uh, have proposed and developed these classes have drawn from very cutting edge industrial uh, type uh, research. It is not uh, sort of old fashioned or classical types of things. It's, it's courses that have been de developed with uh, you know working professionals working in high tech in mind. So that's the key here uh, in this program. So uh, Beth, maybe the next slide, please. So there, it's broken up into uh, four components. Uh, there's technical foundation, and that's nine units. What that means is uh, three one-unit classes from three different themes. Uh, we have seven units in a single theme that's depth, and then, of course, breadth, which is six units outside of the technical depth theme. What that simply means is, is the 22 classes you take, you can take from across the board, and there are five different areas, as we'll talk about uh, shortly. The capstone project then brings it home with a two-unit uh, project uh, that you develop uh, along with a faculty advisor. So if you look at the pie chart, it, it has four main components, a capstone project, which is uh, two units, foundation, which is nine units, depth, which is seven units, and breadth, which is six. So the idea is, is that by blending all of these together, you can draw from the best from the College of Engineering. So uh, Beth, next slide, please. So let's look at the curriculum uh, momentarily. So the five uh, interdisciplinary themes are infrastructural uh, systems and engineering, biomedical and biomechanical engineering, engineering data analysis, advanced manufacturing and materials, and electrical power and autonomous systems. Now, permeating all of these kinds of different uh, tracks is the fact that we have, uh, in addition, a, a strong component of machine learning and AI that permeates all of these different topics because you learn how to apply these types of uh, broad skills uh, to many different you know, physical domains. So it's very physical, this type of degree, but it has a lot of high-tech simulation in the background, which reflects what we believe is what is needed in industry. So Beth, uh, next slide. So for example, uh, you know, what typical examples of courses that are taught, uh, techniques in electronic uh, fabrication, that's primarily, you know, design of electrical widgets and gadgets, the most high-tech possible by Anna uh, Arias. She's a professor of, of electrical engineering. Uh, ocean engineering, which is, you know, sort of broad, but mainly energetic systems, the basics of energy uh, uh, extraction from ocean type problems, things of that sort. Introduction to design methodology by Professor Kosa Goser Lambert, which is again a cross cutting type of skill. Engineering energy systems by Professor Scott Mora, that's primarily the grid, uh, electrical charging, uh, distribution of power, 
uh, for electrical mobility, things of that sort. Uh, authentic and introspective leadership by Professor Lisa Pruitt. Again, that's uh, also a broad, uh, I guess, cross-cutting type of course where we're basically looking for how to develop managerial skills and leadership skills in many different areas. Uh, introduction to aerodynamics, again, Professor uh, Reza Alam, designing for the human body, Java and software, again, cross-cutting by Professor Josh Hug. Uh, nuclear energy and the environment, uh, taught by uh, Max uh, Fratoni. And then, of course, flying robots and drones and aerial taxis, which is, of course, a super hot topic these days taught by Professor Mark Muller. So again, what you see there is that the, the themes cross-cut across many different areas, themes one, four, five in some cases, and in some cases, all the different themes. So anybody that's in any one of those uh, particular tracks could also take these courses with no problem uh, in their track as well. So Beth, we move to the next slide. So for, as an example, uh, the faculty, they were listed, in fact, some of them that were there. We have roughly 30 faculty involved in this program, so that's quite a lot. Uh, four, for example, just to give you a cross-section of, of who's actually doing this kind of stuff is Professor Grace O'Connell, who's a professor of mechanical engineering, Professor Josh Hug, who's in electrical and computer sciences, uh, Lisa Pruitt, who's in mechanical engineering, and Scott Mura, who's an expert in civil and environmental engineering, in particular grid-type technologies. So it's it's real faculty. Uh, it's the same faculty that teach the students here on campus at any given time, but they've really uh, become intrigued by online. I think we all have after, I think, the pandemic and before the pandemic even. So we feel that the time is right to unveil a top-tier program, and that's where we are today. So... Beth, maybe next uh, slide. So for career. All right. Well, in general, the the types of careers that you would be, you know, looking for, at least how we have conceptualized this, is that you know the targets are companies like Apple, Boeing, Google, Microsoft, Siemens, Tesla, GM, Meta. These are all the places that our typical masters and PhD students uh, go to uh, in the Bay Area and, in fact, worldwide. And the types of industries, of course, uh, advanced manufacturing, integrated circuits, data science, water management, energy, et cetera. These are what we think is the best of the best, exciting areas in exciting companies that have the ability to really uh, bring out the best in engineers. So our, our objective is, is to train people that are technically motivated, and also potentially want uh, management types of roles. It could be a technical management uh, person for an entire team, but it could be someone that also wants to be purely deeply into tech and become a technical specialist within one of these uh, types of programs. So this isn't some kind of like MBA type thing where it's going to be broad and you know, you're not going to get technical depth. That depends upon what your interests are. You can choose to become super technically deep and not so broad, or you can choose to be somewhat broad and not technically deep in a specific area. There's a way to tune and balance that uh, with this program. So Beth, uh, next slide. Great, um, thanks Tark. At this time, I have a couple questions about the curriculum that I'd like to just take this opportunity to, um, to ask you. I think they're great questions at this time. Um, so, it's about the one unit structure of, of the, um, the courses. So these courses are one unit. So are they deep enough to grasp the full knowledge of machine learning, deep learning, and AI? Yes. Um, there aren't any specific courses in that area, and those are really important. Yes, I mean, they're, they're, they are technically deep. These aren't TED type talks where you know you get just some kind of PowerPoint slides and so forth. We've gone out of our way to embed into a one unit class the key, the key crystallization of what is important without any extra added padding. Now, recall that if you take three of these one unit classes, they should add up to be three units. They're in fact probably more. You get really much more out of a one unit class uh, that is one third of a three unit class simply because all of the you know superfluous information that may be in a normal class are really stripped away and it is really metal on metal contact. So what happens is, is that you really have uh, depth 
uh, immediately in a one unit class. And so stringing together 22 of these things is a really powerful uh, type of, of experience. The reason that we broke them into one unit classes is because we wanted more flexibility for people to take the best of each topic without having to necessarily suffer through an entire three unit class in an area that they may not want. So for example, you can take a sequence of one, two, and three classes in machine learning and get everything that you would have gotten in a three unit machine class, machine learning class, but even more. So in other words, it really strips away everything that is extra and really goes to the heart of the matter relatively quickly, which is what we believe is one of the failings of online programs. In general, in the past, three units has been a long, arduous path. I mean, if you're thinking about a three unit online class, it takes, you know, theoretically 13 to 15 weeks. That's long and people don't finish. Uh, one unit making things in bite-sized chunks where it's, you know, three to four weeks apiece uh, is much more palatable and people can squeeze into their busy schedule. So I think it also has a psychological effect after having taught online for many, many years. We believe that three unit or one unit classes are the key to completion and also satisfaction psychologically from the person that takes it. Three units is a bit long. I mean, we can take it to redacto absurdium. Let's suppose we had an online class that was 20 units long and it was just one, one class, but it was 20 units long. I mean, no one would finish it. It would take years and people would be suffering through it. So you have to scale back down and ask yourself, where is the comfort zone? And we believe that at one unit, shorter than that, it might become a little bit too choppy. More than that, have a tendency to not finish. So that's why one unit uh, was designed. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I, um, someone is asking about the time limit to finish individual courses, and it is within a semester. So we offer classes within the summer semester, which is 12 weeks, and the fall and both the spring semesters, which are 15 weeks each. So that is the time period you have for each course. Um, and then one last question, Tarek, before I transition um, to the rest of the presentation. Um, let's say somebody is a senior engineer working for a major corporation, a tech company. Um, will this program help them boost their career for future opportunities, both in their company or other companies in the field of energy and high tech? Could be both. Depends upon how someone wants to design it. If they're designing it in such a way that their existing company that they want to develop skills that move them up within their current employer. They can design and take classes that help them in that direction. However, if they're thinking about transitioning and they're saying, you know, look, I started out, let's say as an electrical engineer and I want to transition to an environmental engineer with still some electrical engineering skills, this program can do that as well. The key is, you know, to go to the website and to look and study the flexibility of it. That's the key part. Great, thank you. Sure. Great. Oh, again, why, while we're in your section, I, one more question. I think there are a lot of good questions coming in the Q&A. So thank you everyone for doing that. Um, can you talk to us about prerequisites? Are there, is there a system of, um, you know, numbering the courses like foundational or um, any specific prerequisites for specific classes? Yeah, these weren't numbered in such a way that there's some special secret you know, sequence that we haven't told you. Uh, these numbers were just developed because the course catalog only has certain numbers available. We've tried to make each class truly self-encapsulated, and that's what makes it them difficult to develop, and it takes a really some care and some time because we don't want one to build on the other. That would make it more complicated, less flexibility, the inability then to go from course to course so we really strive for self-encapsulation. Now, the program itself, and we've gone through a lot of soul searching to say, what is the minimum you know, needed to come into this? Because again, a lot of what is being designed is for people to transition from one field to the next is a STEM degree. I mean, if you don't have an undergraduate STEM degree, it's going to be rough going, and I, this program definitely is not for you. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean engineering. It could be you're a, uh, you know, a biochemist that you've had enough math and physics 
no problem. This we these courses are self encapsulated enough that you can do it. Uh, you could be someone who's a data analyst as long as you have enough math and physics. No problem. You could be a numerical economist. No problem. Math and physics is the key part of this. So some type of STEM degree uh, in your bachelor's uh, is is probably the the best uh, you know prerequisite. Of course, if you're an electrical or mechanical or civil or any of the classical engineering you know disciplines, of course that's going to be the the best possible you know training a priori. But it doesn't preclude people from other fields: physics, chemistry, all over the place. Wonderful. Well, thanks to our faculty director, Professor Zodi. Um, I'm going to transition um, to my part of the, the admissions part of this presentation. And Professor Zodi, if you would like to join Felicia answering the Q&A um, chat there, um, please feel free um, and I'll continue with the presentation. All right. So hopefully now you've learned um, a lot more about the, the curriculum and the structure of the program and you are um, interested in applying. So I wanted to give some more information about the tuition and fees for this program. So we um, are a pay as you go program. So you're paying for whatever courses that you're taking in a given semester. The tuition is $17.50 per unit or per one unit class. And in addition, there are some um, Berkeley campus fees um, for all of the um, support and infrastructure, uh, online remote infrastructure that the um, university provides. And they are currently about $900 per semester. So um, as you can, you probably conclude, so the tuition cost is forty-two thousand, um, and then those additional fees will vary um, by the depending on the number of semesters that you're enrolled. So, um, how will you pay for this program? So we offer um, partial scholarships and grants. Um, these scholarships and grants are um, evaluated, um, or candidates are evaluated based on both academic merit financial need, as well as educational diversity. So there are awards for each of these areas as well as those combined. So we um, give back um, a you know, portion of tuition and fees um, based on these areas. So I would say not everybody gets a scholarship or grant, um, but um, we do give partial grants and scholarships of a, with a wide range of amounts. So there are also other sources other than the program um, funding. Um, it's always worth asking your employer um, if they're willing to sponsor you. Many companies um, have a um, educational reimbursement program. Um, there are also private loans and exter external scholarships available. All right, at this point, I'm going to transition to the bulk of our presentation, which is the admissions process and how to um, submit a competitive um, and successful application. So first I'd like to make sure everyone is aware of um, the deadlines. So the application process is entirely online at grad.berkeley.edu. Um, and we have two deadlines for each term. So we admit for summer, fall, and spring. And each of those has a priority or an early decision deadline and then a final deadline. So if you're applying for that term, you do need to have your application in and complete, including your letters of recommendation submitted by that final deadline and any test scores like um, the TOEFL exam, if that's required for you as an international student by that final deadline. So like with um, most graduate programs, um, there are um, a set of application requirements that you may be familiar with. Um, one, we ask for a resume. We like to see your academic, or we need to see your academic transcripts. They can be unofficial. Um, we are looking for a STEM degree, broadly defined. There are two essays, the statement of purpose and personal history statement, and I will go into some advice and the differences between those in a moment. Uh, we ask for two 
letters of recommendation, and I have some tips on those. Like I mentioned, um, if you are an international student um, where the official language of your country is not English, then you will need to take the TOEFL or the IELTS. There are some ex exceptions, but our graduate division website has all the details on that. And I'd also like to emphasize that the GRE exam is not required. There is a place in the application to include it if you have taken it um, and you want to share that towards your candidacy, um, but it is definitely not required. All right, how do you, how do you apply? So you create a login account um, at grad.berkeley.edu um, and you make sure that you're applying for the Mass E program and that you've chosen the term that you want to start your classes. Um, and it's important to note that UC Berkeley does only allow applicants to apply to one program per academic year. So if you're, if you're looking at multiple programs um, at UC Berkeley, you will need to decide before you start your application which one that you will apply to. Um, and when you're in that online application, you'll notice that there are a lot of asterisks, <laughs> um, either multiple pages um, that you fill out and there are a lot of asterisks. Those asterisks mean that is a section or um, a, a text box that you do need to fill out. So that's what all of those mean. All right, so here's some illustrations um, that, that really show you what um, I'm talking about in terms of choosing the admit term and the program. So once you do that, it'll tell you the final deadline that you're working towards. Another aspect of the application um, that Professor Zodi addressed earlier are the, the themes to Mass E. So we are interested in knowing what themes you want to focus on. Now, this is really to help us plan you know, who, um, when we admit a cohort of students for a given semester, what are the types of courses that they're interested in, right? And that helps us plan what courses to offer. Um, this also helps us look at your transcripts and experience and see how those match um, your interests. I will say that you are not required to stick with the themes that you have expressed interest in. This is really sort of information for us um, and, and ways for you to communicate what you're interested in learning. But again, you're not, you can change your mind at any time. Um, and, but I, so I do encourage you to fill that out um, to just order the five themes um, starting with the one you're most interested in. All right, so one, one very important component of the application is the academic history. Um, I'm gonna take a step back here to talk about holistic review. Um, so I'm talking very specifically about each area of the application, um, but I think it's important to emphasize um, that it is a holistic review process, right? And that means there's no piece that will make or break your application, right? Um, I know a lot of, you know, students who are worried about what our average GPA is, for example, or, you know, are we looking for, um, you know, you to say something very specific? Um, and, and the answer is really every application is unique and we're looking at the whole application and we're looking at you as the whole person. So what that means is, um, you know, you don't have to hit the average GPA as a target. There is a range, right? You don't have to have, say something, you know, there's no specific code that you have to say in your, in your essay or your letter of recommendation, um, you know, that, that we're looking to see. Everyone is different and unique, um, and we're looking to admit students who, who will succeed in the program and that have goals um, that align well with the program. So I just wanted to mention that, that it is really a very, holistic uh, process of um, evaluating the application. So academic history, um, we are looking um, for you to include your unofficial transcripts for anywhere that you have done, um, you know, undergraduate work or work that you are applying to your undergraduate degree, right? So that means that if you started at a community college and then finished at a four-year university, we're gonna wanna see the, the transcripts for both of those schools. 
now. I know we have um, many international students um, in the audience that, that, apply, that, and that apply to Berkeley graduate programs. Um, and there are specific requirements um, for international transcripts. Um, <clears throat> so often an international transcript doesn't have your degree conferral on it, which means we would like to see for the evaluation process, a scanned copy of both your transcript and evidence of your degree, and then also translations. So if your transcript is in a language other than English or Spanish, we do need to see um, translations. Um, and this slide shows you a little bit more detail about um, the accepted types of translations. And this information is also available on the Graduate Division website as well. And so remember, we don't need to see your official transcript. Um, so scanned copies are totally fine. Um, for those students who are admitted, however, we will need a follow-up um, in order to finalize that admissions of, of the official transcripts so we can verify those. All right, so I mentioned GPA and average GPA. Um, we do have a minimum. So um, for students whose undergraduate degree was on a 4.0 scale, the minimum GPA um, for the last two years of coursework is a 3.0. Um, typically at Berkeley, um, the average is about a 3.5 or a 3.7 um, for the GPA, but again, it really varies based on the rest of your education and experience. Um, so you will want to calculate that last two year GPA using a GPA worksheet. And that's um, available um, online or through your undergraduate um, university. Um, and, and it's usually just a, an Excel or a Google spreadsheet that'll help you um, do that calculation. All right, test scores. GRE is not required for the Massey program at Berkeley, um, but the TOEFL or IELTS is required um, if your universe, if your undergraduate degree um, is in a country where the official language is not English. So um, the graduate division has more information on that um, on their website. All right. We do get a lot of questions on um, whether someone who has worked in the U.S., um, you know, who or whose education was entirely in English, although the the official language of the country is not in English, and, and whether or not they do um, need to take um, these tests of English as a foreign language. So, you know, these are the official exceptions for that. Um, unfortunately, there's no exception for working in the U.S., um, but if you have completed at least one year of full-time academic coursework with a 3.0 in the U.S., um, then that, that is an exemption as well. But yeah, there is more information on the Graduate Division website. All right, now I'm going to transition to essays. So for many of you, you have already graduated from undergrad, um, and or um, the undergrad was um, many years ago. So that's something, of course, that you can't change at this point, right? So the, the transcripts are what they are. Um, you know, we're looking the, to see that they demonstrate, um, you know, prerequisites for success in engineering graduate coursework at Berkeley. Um, but, you know, at this point, when you're planning your application, you know, that's something that you just need to gather up and there's nothing you can do to change your GPA or, or change your courses. But something that you can work on are both your essays and your letters of recommendation. That's what's something that you really can um, write. The more time and thought that you put into those, um, the better they can be. So we have two essays that we read um, in support of your candidacy, the statement of purpose and the personal history statement. Both of these should be under a thousand words. Um, we like brevity. It's no problem to have that um, shorter than a thousand words. Um, we want you to get your points across um, with the understanding that the faculty admissions committee are reading a lot of applications, right? So um, my big tips for this is, yeah, don't you don't want to include anything that is repetitive to other areas of your application um, or that is repetitive 
to the other essay or the letters of recommendation. So um, we will talk about both of these. Um, the statement of purpose is really the sort of academic um, testimony about why you want to do this program. How does your educational background, your work experience, your research, and your goals um, match up with this program? And then the personal history statement is an opportunity for you to um, describe really how you're, you, you are unique and how you may have overcome barriers um, to um, where you are today in your career, your academics, and yourself as a whole person. So let's review my tips for the essays. Again, brevity is appreciated. You can be concise and careful with your language. Um, I always say, have a friend or family member take a look at your essays um, and don't be afraid to edit and have many different versions of your essays. I think that, that goes a long way. But your essays should be your own work and they should not um, be the work of um, any AI assistance. This should be authored by the applicant without AI assistance, I should reiterate that. <clears throat> so, and then also, again, I think some sometimes applicants think there is a specific story that we want to hear. Um, you know, that that there is a, um, a type of applicant that, you know, fits fits a mold. And that's really not the case. We are looking for a diverse cohort. So really what we are looking at is sort of the, the honesty um, that you approach um, this information with and that it really is honest and genuinely about what you are and what you're passionate about. So it really almost doesn't matter what you're passionate about, but it's that you really are demonstrating that enthusiasm um, and that you know genuine um, desire to be a part of the program. And then also, I like to say, what what are we reading for between the lines when we're looking at your essays? And it really is, from my perspective, you know, what is this prospective student going to get out of the program? And what are they going to give back to their peers while they're in the program, right? So it really is that um, ability to be, you know, open-minded and ready to participate. And yeah, always edit and proofread. <laughs> All right. So the first essay, of course, is a statement of purpose. Um, and this is really, um, again, academically and professionally, what do you hope to do in the program and how will this help you meet your goals? You are summarizing your interests and your passions and your goals, but you don't want to just uh, reiterate what's in your transcripts or your um, resume. But why are you applying to the Massey program specifically? What is what is it about those themes that interests you? Why is now the time for you to um, to go to graduate school? Right. And the second essay, I've highlighted some of the key points in this essay in this um, prompt. Um, so this is a prompt that you'll see within the application. So all of the you don't have to cover right all all of these prompts you wanna cover what resonates and makes sense to you in your life and your experience, experiences. So this is information about what makes you unique, um, perhaps any barriers you've overcome to accessing higher education. Um, this is where some people talk about whether they're the first in their family to go to college, whether they're the first in their family to go to graduate school, um, whether they um, launched and sold a startup in high school, right? There's a lot of, you know, really unique things that you have in your background at this point, and this is where you can share them. Um, I also think this is also an area where you could explain any hiccups in your transcripts or in your work experience. Um, right where it's if if somebody looking at your transcripts is like oh this you know this semester um, really your grades were a lot lower was there something going on with you you know this is the place to share that all right let's move on to letters of recommendation 
So the Berkeley graduate application online, you'll see does allow you to submit three letters of recommendation. Um, that's the maximum for the all the different programs at Berkeley and programs um, can require less than that. So the Massey program does only require two letters. Two letters is all we need. It is, it is not to your advantage to add that third letter, but it's there um, so that um, if you have a good reason for a third letter, or if you'd like to solicit three letters from three different people um, so that two are received by the deadline, you can use those spaces to do that as well. So let's say within those two letters, ideally, we have one letter that focuses on your academic potential, um, and then one that talks about perhaps your work experience and your leadership potential. Again, they really don't have to fit into those areas, but they shouldn't overlap, right? They shouldn't both be professors that say, hey, this, this person got an A in my class, the end, right? We really want you to choose recommenders not based on maybe uh, a prestigious title or um, you know, a well-known faculty member or a well-known person in industry. It really should be somebody who knows you and your accomplishments well. Um, now the key to strong letters of recommendation um, are to ask early and often and to provide your recommenders with a lot of information. So give them a lot of time before the deadline and provide them perhaps with your resume, with your essays for the program, and perhaps um, a reminder of the key accomplishments that you achieved during your relationship with them that they should know about, right? And so that really sets them up to do a really thorough recommendation because they are attesting to your ability to succeed in graduate level coursework at Berkeley, either through their witnessing of your academics or their witnessing you, of your work experience and potential. So some other tips. Again, I really would emphasize somebody you know well, not a family, family member or friend, but somebody you know professionally or academically. Um, people in these positions usually have experience writing letters um, of recommendations, so they'll know what to do. And they may ask you um, for the type of information that they want in order to do a solid recommendation. All right. I also want to mention um, in, in closing for the advice on admissions um, that there is the opportunity for an application fee waiver. If you are a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, um, there is more information at grad.berkeley.edu how you can apply for an application fee waiver. It's based on either financial need or participation in a long list of um, academic and professional programs in the US um, that will automatically qualify you for a fee waiver. So you can apply for the fee waiver, but you do need to make sure that you are granted that waiver. Um, otherwise, um, you will need to, to um, pay the fee, um, which is about 155 um, for, um, I believe international students and 125 for US citizens and permanent residents, but that may have gone up a few dollars. Um, but it's it is under two under $200 for the application fee. All right. So you have put together a strong application, you've edited, you've proofread, you've followed up with your recommenders, and you press submit and pay the fee. What happens? after you submit that application. You'll still have access to your application portal. Um, so you can check to make sure those letters of recommendation have been received, that your TOEFL scores have been received um, while you wait for your decision. Once you submit, um, the application committee will review your application. Um, and then the graduate division does that final review for final um, official admission. Um, for the Massey program, um, we will do our best to get decisions back to you as soon as possible. Um, in general, um, this is within one or two months after the deadline. Um, 
since we're a new program, it really depends on the number of applications we receive. Um, but you know, you can always check your application portal for the status. Um, and if there's any, if there are any questions or anything missing from your application, we will reach out. All right, so hopefully that has helped you feel more prepared for the application process um, and you feel empowered to um, put together some great essays and to talk to your recommenders um, about submitting those letters. Um, so at this time, I'm going to move to audience questions. I know Felicia and Tarek have already been answering a lot of questions in the Q&A. Um, throughout this presentation. So I thank them for that. Um, so I know that we have a hand up as well. Um, and um, Felicia has been collecting um, some questions to answer live. So for all three of us, um, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to continue to put those in the Q&A chat. Um, let's see, we also have, if we, we have a um, attendee with your hand up, um, so that it's, if Tenny with your hand up, could you please um, ask your question through the Q&A um, text box? I think that would really best help us manage that. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Felicia, are there any questions um, that you have um, for us to answer verbally? Sure, one question that we have is, um, is the GPA requirement 3.0 overall um, or for just the last two years of undergrad? Uh, great question. So um, the technical <laughs> minimum is 3.0 for those last two years or the you know upper division years of your undergrad education. But I can say generally um, 3.0, you know, overall is, is important. <laughs> um, and our average GPA for Berkeley um, professional grad programs at engineering um, is a 3537. Um, so if you do not have a 3.0, you know, at the last two years um, or even overall, you know, we'd like to hear about that in your essay. You may be why um, that is the case. Um, and it certainly, um, you know, context is, is really important when you're explaining that. Thanks, Felicia. Um, right now, we don't have any other questions queued up, but um, yeah, I'm sure we can All right. keep it open <laughs> for a little bit. Yeah, of course. All right, so um, we will continue um, to stay on this webinar for those who want to keep asking questions. Um, but if you have to um, move on with your day, I do wanna say you know, thank you for spending this time with us. Um, here's some ways to contact us and learn more about the program. Um, and we hope to receive your application. All right, looks like we have some more questions. Sure. Okay, so one question we have is what sort of career advising resources are there? As um, as this is a new degree, I'm concerned if employers will recognize this. That is a great question. Um, so the three of us have been involved with starting several professional master's programs here in the College of Engineering. Um, and what we've been really pleased to see is that employers, you know, especially those in the Bay Area, um, tech employers recognize a master's degree from the College of Engineering, right? And they really understand the rigor, um, the quality of the education um, that is offered to all of our students. So, um, you know, we started the Master of Engineering program um, and we have a Master of Analytics program. Um, a wide variety. And really what we know is employers recruit master's students, PhD students at Berkeley's College of Engineering. So um, sometimes um, we are talking to them about maybe the you know nuanced differences between the curriculum of those programs. So for the Mass E program, the kind of thing we would talk about would be you know the depth and the breadth offered, um, as well as the capstone project. Um, at the end, 
Um, but really the type of curriculum, um, right, and the additive focus of these cutting edge short courses um, are really going to be of interest to them. And I think that's related to the question asked earlier um, about how this program can help advance your career. Um, so really, you know, I'd say, you know, Gradu graduate students in Berkeley engineering are really in, in, in high demand, and I don't see any issues um, with this program. I do wanna address, I know part of the question was also about resources. Um, so we have several layers of career resources, starting with um, UC Berkeley as a whole and the Career Center there. We also have Career Center resources for the entire College of Engineering, as well as specifically for engineering professional programs. Um, so there, I would say there's more opportunities to attend, um, you know, brown bag panels, um, to attend employer networking advice, to attend info sessions and recruiting events and career fairs, then, then sort of, you know what to do with it. And a lot of those are online. So I understand because this is, you know, a completely online program, um, you know, we're not expecting anybody to have to come to campus to take advantage um, of those um, career development programming opportunities. Tark, do you have anything you'd like to add about, about um, career and uh, the, yes. recognizing the degree? So I'm looking at some of the chat questions. I mean, basically, uh, there's two main ones for three, actually, which is, how do we evaluate applications for people that have been, you know, out of school for quite some time, but have worked in industry or as a teacher or so forth? We really try to look at the application holistically and not be focused on one single metric like GRE or things like that. We, we've really moved past that at Berkeley. We want to look at the whole application as a whole to see, you know, how successful that person can be uh, with, you know, the information or the education that we provide. So, uh, we're looking at it, you know, with a lens of working professionals. Uh, in terms of uh, economics or any funding, I think the question is asking any funding is provided for the provided. I believe Beth answered some of those questions, but I think maybe she can explain it a bit further if, if there's time. Uh, and then also, uh, how selective is it? Well, it depends upon, you know, how many applications we have, but we're looking for around 100 to 150 in the first year, uh, we will ramp up probably over time to about its steady state, 200 people admitted per year, uh, so that within the system as a whole, the ecosystem, our objective is roughly at around 500 people would be in any given time in the program. That could be in any year one, two, or three. So that's the range of how many people we believe we can handle uh, of course, if things were and the, you know, degree groups, you know, widely successful, we want to have access to more and more people since it is online. We're not physically constrained in the sense that there, you know, we have buildings or rooms that we can't handle the capacity. So we could probably increase that. Uh, but those are the targets right now. Uh, and I think one other question was, are we going to add courses? Of course, uh, right now, I mean, we've developed the first and we believe we'll, we'll have roughly 40 uh, courses uh, starting when the program uh, is, you know, uh, live and online in September 2024. Uh, but we intend to ramp up to roughly about 120 to 150 classes at steady state. So the idea is this will be a, a relatively large uh, pool of courses. Now, they're not all 150 offered every semester. So clearly, there's going to be, you know, we assume roughly about a third of those at any given time. So I'd say somewhere between 35 to 40 classes would be offered at any given semester at steady state. But as I said, we're starting. So uh, when we're starting with around 40, we probably are going to offer all 40 in the beginning uh, just to simply get the program going. But uh, long term, 150 classes roughly about 40 every semester that are being offered. Uh, let's see, there were other questions about uh, qualification of what, you know, can serve as, as courses that we look at. We're looking again at the applications holistically in the sense that if there are other kinds of credentials that go beyond simply, you know, a classic undergraduate degree in physics or engineering or so forth, 
we'll take those into account when we look at the applications. So again, it's, it's a, you know, we're trying to look at this uh, holistically to see what people have done. I, that's all I had, uh, Pat. Hey, thank you. The Q and A. <laughs> yes, and I will say, um, regarding the curriculum, there is a longer list of the courses um, that will be offered on the Mass E um, website. So you can take a look at that. Um, there's also a great FAQ on our website. So it's the website that's posted here up on the slide. Um, and the, oh, I see, um, Professor Zodi, there's another question related to the five interdisciplinary. Yeah, I just see it, yes. So, okay. so basically right now, those five are pretty large uh, tracks. I mean, they hold a lot of different possible courses within them. They're relatively, you know, all encompassing, but, you know, we will consider in the future as things evolve, tracks might get deleted and tracks might get added. It's a living program. So we don't want anything to be static. We believe the five that are existing right now have staying power for quite some time, uh, but we could add extra tracks, but that depends upon whether we have enough courses in the track. So simply adding a track without, you know, having the courses to back it up would be unwise. So generally, we're we're looking for things that the faculty are interested in teaching and that they feel passionate about, as opposed to just simply something that might be a fad today, but there are really no courses in it. Uh, it might, you know, have an ephemeral uh, quality to it. So the five tracks that we have right now are pretty much for the next couple of years going to be there. You know, we we'll, we revisit it periodically uh, and hopefully you know if there's some type of an area that is evolving that we feel that is is quite important we would add a track in that area right now these are the five now underneath each of these five there's a lot of 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 courses so generally speaking this is not um and they're cross disciplinary i mean you could argue oh well engineering data analysis has a lot of overlap with electrical and power and autonomous systems that's probably true because Without data, you really can't do much in the world of electrical and power and autonomous systems. Same with manufacturing and materials and infrastructural you know, uh, systems. It's about structural engineering, material science, new materials, uh, optimizing designs. Both might involve finite elements, for example. Again, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're cross-disciplinary. So, uh, all I can say is that the tracks and for the future, they would have to reflect something that is significant in society that is, is coming along. And right now we feel that these five are what we can handle and what we feel comfortable with offering. Doesn't preclude something in the future, but again, those are the five for right now. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, a uh, question about workload. So uh, the workload is self-paced. Um, what is the expected hours per week to finish in four years? So in, I would say, um, I, let's talk this through. So if you're finishing in four years, that means you're probably taking about three units um, a semester for um, eight semesters. And um, each unit class, typically represents um, about. Um, yeah, I would say that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I would say 45 yeah, so, so, hours of work per unit. Right. You agree? Yeah, that's about right. So, I mean, if you look, if you go to classical, what's taught right now at universities, a typical semester would be about 15 weeks for a three unit class. So that's going to be five weeks for a three or for a one unit class, if you divide it equally. And then you ask yourself, well, I mean, how many times do people meet during a five every week? Uh, it's typically two sessions of roughly 75 minutes to 80 minutes is what people would have as their contact hours with an instructor. Uh, you're expected to do two to three hours a week on top of that. So I would say that if you really wanted to calculate the time spent, let's say, watching a video or going to a lecture, and then the amount of time you have to spend on that course, two to three hours a week, probably for a single 
one unit class, five hours a week for five weeks would probably do it as a, as a minimum. You took two or three of them, might be 10 hours a week. You took four or five of them, again, it scales. So I think, you know, the question is, is really going to be is where do you want to be in one year or two years? Four years is stretching it, but it certainly we want it to be, you know, conceivably possible. However, the sweet spot, in my opinion, is to try to finish within two years, two and a half at most. I think that would be comfortable. Also, theoretically, someone could be a maniac and want to, you know, take all the classes and go at, at breakneck speed. Theoretically, they could probably finish in seven, eight months. I mean, but that would be working 24-7 all day long, just focused on this. It's it's possible, possibly unwise, but it depends upon, you know, what, you know, people are doing. I mean, if you're in between jobs and this is what you're passionate about to make a career move, then maybe this is the way to go. Just Great. Thank you for that um, detailed look at, at the, the commitment involved in the program. Um, well, we are at time. Um, so I want to thank you, our prospective students, for your interest in the new Berkeley Mass E program. And I want to thank my colleagues also um, for joining me in this session. Um, please don't hesitate to contact us um, using the QR code or the email address explore our website and we're happy to answer any of your questions and help you along in the application process. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful day and go Bears. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you.